I'm sure we all have fond memories of visiting seaside towns across the UK and the sunny weather has got us thinking ahead to our summer holidays. From Blackpool to Bournemouth, there are over 150 seaside resorts dotted across the country, which have been attracting visitors for hundreds of years. But how have the ways we use and view these spaces changed? And what might the future hold? Tonight, we'll be exploring the past, present and future of the great British seaside with some of our experts from Bournemouth University. Here's what we've got coming up. We'll have four speakers this evening who will each be giving short presentations with a short break before our final speaker this evening. We'll then have around 20 minutes at the end of the event for a discussion with all of our speakers. So please do use the ask a question box at the bottom right of your screen to post your questions for all of our speakers throughout the event. And we'll try and get through as many of them as we can in the discussion at the end. We'll aim to wrap up the event at about 8.30 p.m. This event is the second in our online public lecture series, which is showcasing some of the ways in which Bournemouth University research and expertise is having an impact on the world around us. To tell us more, here's a short video and a message from our Vice-Chancellor, Professor John Binney. Thank you for joining us for this evening's public lecture which highlights research brilliance at Bournemouth University. The lecture series covers many of our areas of academic strength, from healthy ageing to protecting the environment, championing culture and heritage, challenging marginalisation, managing crisis and disaster, and helping to support Dorset's economy. We're very proud of all the work that we do at the university and the impact that it has on the world and I hope that this evening's lecture really provides you with a, a new insight into the work that we're doing to change the world and make it a better place. We're using the Crowdcast platform for tonight's event. For those of you who aren't familiar with Crowdcast, there's just a few things to be aware of. Firstly, we're not going to be able to see or hear you. Only our speakers will have their cameras and microphones on throughout the event. So the best way to interact with us and with each other is through the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. And it's brilliant to see so many of you have already found the box and are using it to tell us where you're joining us from this evening. Um, across the UK, Stowe Market, Harwich, Southport, welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us tonight. Our speakers may also have some questions for you as well, so they'll be using polls throughout their presentation. 
These will appear at the bottom right of your screen, just next to the Ask a Question box, and will consist of multiple choice questions that are expressed anonymously and as percentages. So please don't be worried about saying the right or wrong thing. Just get involved. We really want to hear from you. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce our first speaker for this evening, Dr. Anya Chapman, who's going to be talking to us all about how the Great British Seaside came to be. Hi, Anya. Thank you for joining us this evening. Hi, Emma. And as Emma rightly pointed out, there are around about 150 seaside resorts. And many of these seaside resorts developed in the 19th century as holiday destinations. In the 18th century, visitors to the British coast were mainly from the aristocracy and upper classes and were drawn to the seaside for the health giving properties of sea bathing. Now, I'd like to start off, hopefully, if the technology will allow it, uh, and ask uh, the audience uh, a quick question, which you can type your answer into the chat box below. Um, I'm going to start with a fairly easy one. Which do you think was the first UK seaside resort? <laughs> I can see technology getting the blame here. <laughs> Any ideas? Which was the UK's first seaside resort? OK, we've got a couple of answers coming in. We've got Scarborough uh, from Susan, Blackpool from Alex, uh, Weymouth, Hastings, a couple of Scarboroughs. Oh, Brighton's coming up quite a bit. Uh, Weymouth, Blackpool again, Scarborough. Mm, and Margate coming in there as well. OK, so there seems to be quite a lot of you thinking okay Scarborough there's one for South End okay oh some some interesting answers there um well for those of, <laughs> Bogner <laughs> big shout out to Bogner um well for those of you who actually answered Scarborough um you would have been correct uh so Scarborough is rightly proud of its status as Britain's first seaside resort Scarborough developed from a spa town and by the 1730s it was catering for visiting gentry with facilities such as reading rooms and assembly halls. Now who mentioned Margate? Did anybody mention Margate? Uh, because Margate also lays claim to be Britain's first seaside resort with visitors arriving from London by a stagecoach for its bathing facilities. Um, and some of you, I did notice quite a few of you um, also mentioned uh, Brighton or Bright Helmstone as it was in the 1730s. Um, and this also became renowned for sea bathing, although in Brighton, um, its bathing machines, its spa, its library and its assembly rooms only really became established in the 1750s. And that was after the publication of Richard Russell's dissertation on the use of seawater in the diseases of the glands, in which he recommended drinking and bathing in seawater for the cure of swollen lymph glands caused by viruses and infections. As the popularity of the health benefits associated with sea bathing grew, the middle classes began to be drawn to the seaside from the 1750s onwards and resorts such as Eastbourne, which I'm really hoping that you might be able to see on your screen at the moment, um, and also Weymouth were developing facilities for their health conscious visitors during the mid 18th century onwards. As these resorts became more popular and successful, new locations on the British coast were being developed to cater for the increasing number of now middle class visitors. By the early 19th century, new watering places were developing, such as my hometown of Southport. And I know there's a couple of sand grounders in here tonight and also Bournemouth. Bournemouth's development as a fashionable health resort is interesting because it offered not only the opportunity for sea bathing, but it also had the added benefit of breathing the scent of pine trees, which was reputed to cure respiratory illnesses. Rather interestingly, 
Bournemouth still has a few icons from its time as a health resort. Invalids Walk, which was a pine-lined route from one of Bournemouth's leading spa hotels to the sea, can still be found today in Bournemouth's lower gardens, although today it is more appropriately named Pines Walk. And the successor to the bathing machine, which was so essential for sea bathing in the early resorts, was the beach hut. Britain's oldest surviving beach hut, hut number 2359 at Bournemouth, which was built in 1909, is now rightly commemorated with a blue plaque. The nobility and the upper classes continued to visit British seaside resorts for health reasons until around the mid 19th century. However, a number of changes were taking place in the mid to late 19th century that broadened the appeal and accessibility of the resorts to the mass market. These changes were largely brought about by the 1844 Railway Regulation Act, which made provisions for all railways to offer third class furs at a cost of no more than one penny per mile. And this also facilitated the upgrade of third class travel and third class travel now included such luxuries as carriages with seating and in fact roofs. What luxury. In addition, there was an increase in leisure time for working people, firstly via wakes weeks where factories would close down for a week, providing the workers in industrial towns and cities with a week's unpaid holiday. And secondly, through the 1871 Bank Holidays Act, which provided for bank holidays in the UK. These two social changes led to what is known as the democratisation of travel and made the British seaside resorts accessible to the masses. However, these visitors were less attracted to the resorts for health reasons and instead, with their limited funds and time, they sought to be entertained at the seaside. Piers, which had once been functional structures for landing steamer passengers at the resorts, became sites of entertainment with the addition of theatres and bandstands, such as this pier in the image, again of my hometown in Southport, built in 1860, but had its theatre added in 1897. Resort promenades, such as this one at Eastbourne, gained the addition of bandstands, carefully manicured gardens, and shelters in which to relax and take in the sea air. Ballrooms, theatres and circuses, such as this one, the Blackpool Tower Circus, uh, this is showing the redesign by Frank Matcham in 1899, were found at many resorts. And visitors to the seaside really sought extraordinary experiences from walking over the waves on seaside piers to the latest thrill rides, such as this one, the Sahiran Maxim's flying machine, which can still be found operating at Blackpool Pleasure Beach today. Even when the weather turned sour, visitors to the seaside could be kept entertained in winter gardens such as those at Bournemouth, Blackpool and Great Yarmouth, or other indoor attractions such as aquaria or pavilions. British resorts and their extraordinary entertainments continued to be popular during the interwar years, but there were two significant factors that changed why we did like to be beside the seaside during this time. Firstly, the 1938 Holidays with Pay Act provide workers with a week's paid holiday for the first time, a change which Billy Butlin made the most of, advertising his holiday camps at places such as Skegness, Clacton and Filey as a week's holiday for a week's wages. Secondly, there was a change in tourism trends, with the fashion for a healthy tan taking off from the 1920s. Prior to this, tan skin had been associated with outdoor labour. Many resorts were promoted with reference to sunny days or sunshine hours, such as in this 1930s railway poster for the resort of Rill. 
As the quest for a tan became more fashionable, seaside entertainment changed to reflect these tastes. Many resorts featured seaside lidos in a modern Art Deco style, including at Penzance, the Jubilee Pool, which was built in 1935. And Britain's first seaside solarium opened in 1932 at Branksome Chine here in Poole. And it offered visitors year round sunbathing via the latest sun lamps whilst they were still able to enjoy the views of the sea. Even resort entertainment venues built during the interwar period, such as the Delaware Pavilion at Bexhill, which opened in 1935, featured many sun terraces. In the post-war period, British resorts remained popular, with some of the more traditional entertainments receiving a very modern twist. Some piers, such as this one at South Sea Clarence, were rebuilt in a rather modern or brutalist style. And Boscombe Pier received a modern facelift in 1962. Visited, visitors arrived at the 1960s resorts in style, such as this one, uh, Douglas in the Isle of Man. Here you can see the Isle of Man Sea Terminal, which was opened in 1965. And visitors also continued to be attracted by the latest technologies in the resort's plethora of amusement arcades, such as this one in Bridlington. They also enjoyed futuristic attractions such as the monorails, such as this one that features at Blackpool Pleasure Beach. In the 1960s, we did still like to be beside the seaside, enjoying the traditional seaside attractions along with the sun, sea, sand and fresh air. And the resorts were increasingly embracing the future. What could possibly go wrong? Now, this is something that my colleague Tim Gale will be exploring in the next part of this evening's lecture. But before I leave you, I have a very quick poll for you. Um, and the poll, I think, is down at the bottom of your screen. And it's a very simple question. When was the heyday of the British seaside? Was it that early, healthy seaside resort that we explored at the start of this part of the session? The entertaining seaside with those iconic attractions? Or was it the modern seaside from the 1920s to the 1960s? Now, hopefully you can see the poll uh, and you should be able to vote. The only trouble is I can't see the poll. <laughs> Hi, Anya. If you click on the bottom right of your screen, um, you should be able to see it next to ask a question. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to, Emma, but unfortunately it's stuck under the screen that I want to share. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you as they're coming in. I feel like a Eurovision presenter now. But um, so far, the modern seaside is in the lead with 34 votes, followed by the entertaining seaside. Um, and the healthy seaside is lagging behind with only three votes at the moment. So um, modern seaside looks like the winner. Yeah, it, it sounds like we've got some seaside experts in the room because the common misconception is the entertaining seaside. But actually, uh, in terms of visitor numbers, it was the 1950s that the seasides were the most popular. In fact, backed fans, as late as 1968, the British seaside resorts accounted for 75% of all holidays taken by British people with an estimated 40 million visiting the seaside. Thanks for listening. Brilliant. Thank you, Anya. It was really interesting at the beginning to see how many different options people came up with for what was the first seaside resort. So was there this sudden sort of explosion of resorts kind of being created or was it a kind of slow, gradual? Oh, they're doing quite well. Maybe we should try and replicate what they're doing. How did it all sort of start to come about? Yeah, it, it was fairly slow at at the time. Um, so the 1730s, as I said, it was literally a handful of resorts, mainly based on 
quite often where spas had been, such as Scarborough. Um, and then as the re resorts became widened out to an increasing market, the middle classes more and more began to be developed. Um, and as uh, it really took off from the sort of 1800s onwards. And then once the railways started to connect these places up, that, that was it. So, yeah, by sort of the end of the 1800s into the early 1900s, you, it was hard to find a, a, a place on the English or Welsh coasts, at least, that didn't have a resort. Great. So thank you very much, Anya, um, for your you. presentation. And you'll be joining us again at the end of the night for the discussion. So please do keep sharing your questions using the Ask a Question box, which is on the bottom right of your screen. And you can also vote on each other's questions. So if you spot a question in there that you'd particularly like our speakers to answer in the discussion at the end, just click on the little arrow to the left hand side of that question to upvote it. And we'll try and address the most popular ones um, in the discussion. So we've heard from Anya about the heyday of the Great British Seaside. But what happened next? Um, please to introduce Dr. Tim Gale now, who's going to talk to us um, about what happened after that. So, Tim, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Emma. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight in English Tourism Week, no less. Um, we're just going to start with a little experiment. I'd like you to enter into chat a word or a phrase that you associate with the British Seaside Resort. If this was social media, something that would work well as a hashtag, um, and we'll see what the answers are. We'll crowdsource some attitudes, ideas. Go on, who's going to be the first? Sandcastles, wonderful. Grockles, yeah, well, that's a very particular regional term, isn't it? Um, ice cream, fun. Yes, candy floss, punch and duty. Yes, fantastic. This is all... Uh, speaks to the heyday of the British seaside and what's unique, uniquely British about the seaside resort. Brilliant. And we've even got emojis from uh, Caroline there. So that's uh, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, Adam, if you could share my presentation, that would be great. And just starting off, um, I suppose, with a personal anecdote here. It's, uh, I, well, let me tell you what my five-year-old self would have uh, would have put into that chat box there. I would have put hashtag magic. Uh, that's very much how I saw the British seaside at the time. Growing up in South Wales in the 1970s, I'd accompany my family on holidays to Devon and Dorset. Routinely, we'd stay at the same holiday camp or apartment let. Many happy memories. Everything changed for us as a family in 1984, I'm showing my age now, when we had our first holiday abroad to Spain. And we weren't the only family to switch from domestic to overseas holiday destinations during that decade. Something that understandably presented a huge challenge for British seaside resorts. I think it's fair to say that some resorts fared better than others in rising to that challenge. Uh, next slide. So between 1979 and 1988, visitor nights at British Seaside Resort declined by 39 million. That's 27%, 27% over a quarter of the market lost in a mere decade there. Um, one of the main reasons for this, of course, is competition from home and abroad in the form of cheap foreign package holidays, uh, destinations offering virtually guaranteed sunshine, but also inland locations within the UK, theme parks, holiday villages like Alton Towers and Centre Parks, which were popular with short break and day visitors who might otherwise go to the seaside. By the late 20th century, many British resorts have been around for some 150 years or more, with buildings and infrastructure in need of repair and repurposing for modern tastes. As competition and depreciation started to bite, so we saw hotels, B&Bs, holiday apartments and visitor attractions closed and demolished or converted to other uses. For many Britons, especially the emerging and aspirational middle classes, the seaside holiday had become a bit of a joke, an embarrassment, a place for old people and the unemployed, rather than the destination of choice for the young and upwardly mobile. Next slide, please. So 
So there are many unique challenges facing resorts that put them at a disadvantage. So by definition, they're far removed from the main centers of population. Of course, that was part of their appeal in better days. And that means opportunities for economic development and diversification beyond tourism are limited. Theirs is an aging product that's expensive and difficult to maintain. Windblown sand and salt water are a problem for stone and metal structures. And buildings and signs become bleached in the sunshine and read regular painting. Resorts rely or relied on a basket of things to see and do that are dependent on good weather and are highly seasonal. That makes them less attractive to investors looking for a guaranteed return. There's perception issues too. Many who no longer visit or have never visited seaside resorts see these places as run down and tacky, whereas others, principally millennials, who might be more positively disposed to the coast, have limited awareness of places to visit beyond the region in which they live. Next slide, please. Uh, so an anecdote. Some 20 years ago, the chairman of the Wales Tourist Board said to me that the ensuite bathroom killed the British seaside resort, um, which puzzled me somewhat at the time. Uh, but this was a very typical view among practitioners. His logic being, of course, that uh, by that time, people had become used to ensuite standard in uh, hotels in overseas locations, and many older British resorts didn't provide that or couldn't keep up with that standard. Um, however, this is, as I say, this is very typical um, of uh, the popular perception of the British seaside and why it declined. And our understanding resort decline rarely goes beyond those symptoms and surface appearances reduced visitation, poor quality accommodation, tired attractions, image problems, toilets again, yeah, and so on, to interrogate the root causes. Now, theories advanced by academics point to aging destinations and younger, more fashionable alternatives as explanations. But the answer is even deeper than that. It lies with changes to the way we worked in the late 20th century, brought on by manufacturing being outsourced to other countries and the growth of the service and information industries. This profoundly affected leisure time and choices and undermined the symbiotic link between resorts and their market areas. Video cassette recorders, computer games, consoles, satellite television led to an increase in the consumption of leisure and entertainment in and around the home, leading to the demise of the end of the peer show and the seaside fun fair. Cheap and widely available medicines offered an instant fix for aches, pains and various ailments that would once have necessitated a holiday by the sea to take the waters and inhale the briny air. In summary, we live in very different times and seaside resorts, or at least those that have failed to adapt, have become an anachronism. Next slide. In the 21st century, things are looking up or at least they were prior to the pandemic. Coastal tourism in the UK is growing again with an estimated 17.1 billion pound tourism spend from 27 million overnight visits plus 217 million day visits. This supports 285,000 jobs, give or take, many of which are in SMEs, according to figures provided by our very local National Coastal Tourism Academy. Uh, this offers calls for celebration and cause for optimism. But crucially, the rate of growth does not match that of the visitor economy in general. There's a performance gap which needs addressing going forward. Next slide, please. In terms of rejuvenation, much good work has been done by the local state and businesses to boost the tourist trade at the seaside. This includes investing in new indoor attractions and facilities, Targeting off-peak growth markets such as health and well-being, business events and international visitors, especially the Germans, Dutch and French. Upgrading accommodation. Conserving the best of the historic built environment, including some splendid Victorian, Edwardian and Art Deco architecture, while enhancing the remainder. Realizing efficiencies through the restructuring of businesses and organizations to make them lean and more productive. And finally, spreading the season through events, Blackpool's illuminations being an excellent example of that. Next slide, please. So let me tell you a story about Sunny Rill in North Wales, where I did the field work for my PhD. 
It was once a destination for fashionable Victorians. Its proximity to Lancashire, Merseyside, the West Midlands saw it transformed into a popular sun and fun resort by the 20th century. By the 1960s, Rill boasted a very aging collection of attractions and amenities, such as the Victoria Pier and Pavilion Theatre. Many of these were removed in the 1970s and 1980s, replaced with a new generation of all weather facilities and themed attractions, uh, such as the Sun Centre that you see here. Hailed as best practice in resort regeneration, this achieved limited success in resurrecting the tourist trade. In fact, close to 40% of service bed spaces were lost between 1989 and 1995. You'll see the next image um, and the next one gives us an idea of this very visible problem. This is real promenade and we have a former seaside hotel boarded up out of use. Remember, this is a shop window for any seaside resort. This is where you want your best buildings, your best experiences. Into the future, uh, there's been an investment in a new water park, an adventure sports area, restaurants and budget hotels. So, you know, it's not all bad news. But Rill, so dependent on EU regional development funds in the last few decades, faces an uncertain future post-Brexit and post-pandemic. Next slide, please. So... You can tell a lot by a resort from the imagery used to sell it to prospective visitors. So this is the front cover of the annual municipal brochure for Rill. This is a 1937 edition. It's more of a guidebook to the serious business of taking a holiday in sunny Rill rather than a brochure. If we advance to the next slide, we see the front cover for 1955. And here Rill's Welshness is being emphasized. This is crucial, of course, because um, resorts did very effectively capitalize on their local sense of place and what made them unique. More on that in a minute. Uh, by 1967, the focus was on the beach and on the attractions, some of which I've mentioned previously. And by 1978, we have something of an identity crisis, ladies and gentlemen. This could be anywhere. It's generic sun, sea, sand, sex. And it's not just real and Prestatin by that point, but many resorts, Bournemouth included, uh, were selling um, holidays to the destination on the back of you know, the sun and fun imagery. Um, they turned their back on what made them unique, what made them special and distinctive. And I think this is a period in which many seaside resorts lost their way. By 1986, um, some recovery. Here we have the inside of the Sun Centre, the most popular attraction in Wales at the time. Remember, that was opened in 1980. And by 1996, the emphasis is on the variety of things to see and do in and around the resort. And I think there's recognition by this stage that it's not just the beach, but real as um, a headquarters for holiday makers who want to explore the surrounding countryside and rural North Wales more generally. Uh, so much for real. What are the future for seaside resorts in general? Um, my research has taken a new direction of late, and I leave you with a vision of the way things might be. One where the beach survives, but as a motif of holidays, but not where you'd expect to find it. So what we see here, there's an urban beach, and this is a phenomenon that's been um, taking off in the last 10, 15 years. Various cities, mostly in Europe, but they're also elsewhere in the world, some in the UK, constructing beaches from quarried sand, deck chairs, wooden decking, palm trees in pots, you name it. And so... Although the beach remains important to us, uh, the question is, is it vital for us to travel to the seaside to experience the beach? If the beach can come to us and be on our doorstep, then what does that mean for physical travel to the coast? Um, particularly given some of the developments, the price of petrol, the cost of living crisis, all these things come into play. And on the final slide there, the, um, my research is also uh taking in virtual worlds and again 
the beach motif is quite strong here. Many um, congregation and gathering spaces in virtual worlds are in tourism-like environments, and this is no exception. When locked down, we pivoted to virtual to a greater or lesser extent. We had meetings on Zoom. Um, some seaside attractions offered virtual reality tours. Uh, the next step might be to fully immerse ourselves in virtual worlds. So again, we may be at the seaside and yet not at the seaside. Um, maybe that's slightly dystopic, I don't know, but it's certainly something to think about as we move forward through the 21st century. And finally, a bit about me. Um, as I said, this uh, uh, coastal tourism was my specialty for my PhD. That was a long, long time ago now. Um, but I'm also interested in new leisure and tourism spaces like the urban beach in the virtual world and tourism hospitality design. Um, I'm always in the market for new Twitter followers. So if you want to connect with me, I share a lot of news, views, links to useful research and reports on Twitter. And I'd be very happy to count you amongst my followers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. That was really interesting. And I loved the childhood picture of you um, at the beginning of the presentation. I think all presentations should start like that from now on. Um, I was just going to ask, it's really interesting that in the chat at the beginning, so many people had these positive, um, nostalgic memories of their time at the seaside, rather than that kind of more negative perception that you spoke about um, in your presentation. So do you think that the seaside has succeeded in rebuilding its reputation? Or do you think a lot of those memories are based on our childhood experiences such as yours in real? Uh, to some extent, yes. Uh, I mean, those views will obviously be representative of the audience that we've we've got here tonight. Um, what's quite interesting is the NCTA did some research with younger people, so millennial generation, and asked them for their views. And there was a mixture of views. Some of those... Uh, epithets, if you like, were repeated there, but also there were more negative connotations, common, chavy. Now, I use the air quotes wisely for, for that, you know. So um, it's a mixed bag, but I think um, uh, to some extent, certainly re resorts generally have repaired their reputation and connected with new markets. The, there's an understanding now that these are great places for health and wellness. We have abundant heritage at the seaside. And, uh, you know, I'd like to think um, gradually attitudes are changing back to being more positive and more reflective of those we see in the chat tonight. Brilliant. Thank you, Tim. And you'll be joining us again in the discussion at the end of the event. So please do keep sharing your questions using the ask a question box. So we've heard about the rich and varied history of our seaside resorts. So it's really important to think about how we protect and preserve our seaside towns as well. We've got Dun Dr. Duncan Light here with us now to talk about our seaside heritage. So I'll hand over to you, Duncan. Thanks. Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, so we've heard from Anya and Tim about the heyday and the decline of the British seaside resort. I want to turn and look at what's happening in the present. But firstly, I want to change the subject for a bit. Uh, I'm going to show you some pictures and ask you to take part in the poll. Uh, so please use the poll facility at the bottom next where it says uh, asking a question. So my first picture is Stonehenge. Now, quick poll. Would you consider that to be heritage? Please vote now. Okay, the votes are piling in for yes, uh, as we'd expect. Uh, I don't think anyone's uh, going to disagree that Stonehenge is heritage. Uh, here's another image. Uh, and again, using the poll facility, tell me if you think the Tower of London is heritage. Uh, yeah, it looks like an overwhelming vote for yes. OK, so let's move on. Uh, here's another image. Blenheim Palace. Again, use the poll facility. Would you consider this to be heritage? And nobody seems to be disagreeing. Everybody thinks it's heritage. Excellent. Uh, here's another image. This is Hack Green Nuclear Bunker in Cheshire. Again, using the poll facility, tell me if you think this should be considered as heritage. Uh, 
Oh, wow. Well, we got a, a super enlightened audience tonight because pretty much everybody is voting yes. Uh, oh, just one vote for no. Uh, and then lastly, here's another image. I don't think it needs any introduction. Using the poll, tell me if you consider this to be heritage. Ah. Uh, well, I sense I'm preaching to the converted, so this is going to be easy. So um, the votes are piling in for yes. Only one person so far uh, has voted no. So uh, we're talking about heritage, and I want to look at this in the context of seaside resorts. But firstly, I want to think about what is heritage. So can I ask you to type into chat what you think heritage is? Like the Not the, the names of individual sites, but the properties of something that make it heritage. So there you go. Over to you in chat. So far, nobody's typed anything. Ah, oh, something old. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Anya. Something special. Ah, oh, here we go. Historical history of historical value, historical significance, place value, old, inherited building or culture. Yeah. Investment from local people, special. Oh, wow, they're all piling in now. I can't keep track of them. A legacy. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for those comments. Now, when we think of heritage in this country, uh, we tend to think of things that are old and beautiful with historical importance. Um, heritage tends to be something that's older than 1850. Um, heritage is very often buildings that are grand and monumental. They are buildings that are valuable and valued. They are buildings which are authentic. They are buildings which are aesthetically pleasing, so they look nice uh, and they're aesthetically of a high quality. They're buildings which are considered to be fragile and because they're old and so they need safeguarding. They're buildings that are important for our national history. And very often heritage is about buildings of places associated with the great and the good, social elites, great men and women of history uh, and so on. Now, Similarly, in this country, we have quite clearly defined ideas about what is not heritage or what heritage is not. So again, can I ask you to type into chat what you think heritage isn't? Or if you like, give some examples of things that you think aren't heritage. Nineteen seventies architecture, Dorset House. If you like, what are the properties of something that means it's not heritage? Or give me some examples of something that's not heritage. Passing fads, concrete, fast fashion, shopping centres, buildings without meaning. Interesting. It seems to be very easy to think about what is heritage. It takes a bit more to think about what heritage isn't. Um, but we've got some interesting things coming up there. When we talk about heritage, we tend to exclude things that are modern, that are commonplace, that have little obvious value, that are inauthentic or perceived as lacking aesthetic beauty or value, um, things that are not important for our national history, and things that are associated with ordinary people. Now, these are generalizations, and it's not always black and white, but we do tend to have quite fixed ideas in this country about what is and what isn't heritage. So let's return to seaside resorts. And you talked about the rise of mass tourism at the seaside. Uh, and the mass seaside heritage created a really quite unique architecture, highly distinctive buildings uh, associated with pleasure, fun, entertainment and distraction. Uh, so, for example, we have places like Brighton Pier, one of more than 100 piers at one stage uh, around the coast. Other things at the seaside include this, a wooden roller coaster at Blackpool Pleasure Beach, the Grand National, uh, built in 1935. Other parts of the heritage of the seaside are these winter gardens that were dotted all over the place and quite a lot of them have been demolished now. Uh, another part of seaside heritage is these grand hotels like the Grand Hotel in Scarborough uh, or think of the Midland Hotel in Morecambe. They're all over the place. Uh, and then we've got things like the Humble Amusement Arcade. Look at this for a fabulous piece of Art Deco uh, in New Brighton li near Liverpool, currently threatened with demolition. Can you believe that? Uh, and then we've got more humble forms of heritage, like these simple beach shelters or the common or garden, but highly distinctive beach huts. There we go. So some quirky beach huts there in Folkestone. 
So uh, there's very little doubt that the architecture of the seaside is highly distinctive, but these sorts of buildings were never thought of as being heritage until quite recently. Because if we go back to what we were saying earlier about what heritage is and what it isn't, the architecture of the seaside didn't fit with these ways that we're used to thinking about heritage because most of the seaside buildings are not particularly old. They mostly date from after 1850. They are playful, brash, auspicious, even vulgar, so they don't meet the criteria for having innate beauty or aesthetic value. Um, many of them don't meet the criteria for authenticity because they've been modified and adapted and patched up over the years. Uh, these are buildings that are associated with ordinary, predominantly working class people, so there's no association with, association with the great and the good. They are buildings associated with fun, distraction and entertainment, so they're not taken seriously uh, as architecture. And until recently, these sorts of seaside buildings weren't valued. An extraordinary number of them have been demolished since the Second World War. So for a whole range of reasons, we haven't really considered the architecture of the seaside to be heritage. But things are changing. Over the past decade or so, we're starting to reevaluate the architecture of the seaside and we're accepting it as being heritage. And there are various reasons for this. Firstly, since 2001, there have been a whole range of government initiatives intended to regenerate traditional seaside resorts, particularly by giving them new products to attract new visitors. So English Heritage, which is the state agency responsible for the uh, historic environment, led in the uh, 2000s on the potential of seaside heritage to contribute to resort re regeneration. Uh, and there are a whole series of government initiatives like Sea Change and Coastal Communities and Coastal Revival Fund that have invested in restoring iconic buildings at the seaside and using them to kickstart wider regeneration. So this is one example. Uh, the Spanish city in Whitley Bay um, refurbished, regenerated through coastal communities funding. Southport Pier is another one. So we got the state getting involved um, and uh, funding regeneration at the seaside. But at the local level, there's also bottom up community activism uh, where communities have campaigned to save uh, buildings that are valuable to them from being demolished and so on. Uh, and they've raised funds and they've conducted campaigns and so on to find a new use for these buildings. For example, you look at Dreamland in Margate and it was local communities that led on saving this from demolition. Uh, and then the third thing is national lottery funding. So when the National Lottery uh, first started, it was very much geared towards traditional concepts of heritage. Like one of the first awards it made was £50 million to the Royal Opera House. But under New Labour, uh, this whole approach changed and there was a much broader range of heritages that received funding. Basically, the National Lottery Fund allowed people to define their own heritage uh, and then gave them money to save it. So some pretty significant sums were directed towards seaside heritage projects. Uh, for example, the Heritage Lottery Fund gave £11 million for rebuilding Hastings Pier. It won't do that again. £4 million for Blackpool Museum, £3 million for Margate's Dreamland Amusement Park, and so on. So surprisingly, we see it's the heritage of seaside resorts that is being taken seriously because of its role in state-led urban regeneration projects at the coast. And the consequence is that seaside towns have a completely new product, heritage. They're no longer dependent on the traditional bucket and spade beach holiday, although that is still important. But heritage enables them to regenerate and diversify, promote themselves as destinations for heritage tourism. And that enables them to bring in new types of tourists, heritage tourists. So this uh, quite dramatic discovery of the heritage of the seaside does have some interesting implications. I'm sure you've all heard of World Heritage Sites, places like the Pyramids, Taj Mahal, Machu Picchu, the Tower of London, Bath, the castles of North Wales, uh, and so on. So in 2009, Blackpool put together a nomination for World Heritage Site status. The reaction, the reaction was widespread. We're asking you, what, what do you think? Um, do you think Blackpool should be a World Heritage Site? There's a poll down there. Please tell me what you think in the poll. Do you think Blackpool deserves to be a World Heritage Site? Split equally at the moment. Keep voting, keep voting. Okay, so it's about 56% who say yes and about 45% who are saying no. I'm going to try and persuade you. So let me make a case. 
One of the criteria for being a World Heritage Site is that something must be an outstanding example of a type of building, architectural, technological ensemble or landscape which illustrates a significant stage in human history. These are the UNESCO criteria. Now, I would argue that places like Blackpool meet that criterion. Blackpool is an outstanding example both of individual buildings and an entire landscape. The combination of a tower, three piers, the winter garden, all these grand hotels and numerous other buildings dedicated to pleasure is not only highly distinctive, it is unique in the world. It's an outstanding example of a landscape made by and for tourism. Now, Blackpool is also a landscape which illustrates an important stage in human history, the birth of the seaside holiday. So whether it's in the UK or elsewhere, millions of people still choose to go to the seaside for their holidays. Blackpool is where it all started. Blackpool is also the place where mass tourism started. It was the first mass tourism resort in the world. Now, on top of that, we have eight World Heritage Sites in the UK, out of 32 in total, which are industrial sites. They're places like Ironbridge Gorge, where coke was first smelted, the coal mining landscapes of South Wales, the slate mining landscapes of North Wales and Saltaire model, ho model housing for industrial workers in, in uh, Bradford. So we are prepared in this country to accept that industrial heritage can be world heritage. Well, Blackpool was as much a part of the Industrial Revolution as Ironbridge Gorge, the coal mines of South Wales, the slate mines of North Wales, Saltaire workers housing. If we're prepared to accept places where people worked as being World Heritage Sites uh, and places where people lived as being World Heritage Sites, then why can't we accept places where people played as being World Heritage Sites? And Blackpool is that place. It's intimately associated with the Industrial Revolution and it represents a key aspect of industrial life, the annual week's holiday of the sea. So I'm going to do the same poll again. Let me see if I've been able to persuade you. Uh, and the question, once again is should Blackpool, does it deserve to be a World Heritage Site? Tell me what you think by voting now. Well, this is a bit of a result because now about 80% of you are saying yes and about 20% of you are saying no. So hopefully I've been able to persuade you. Um, I don't think it will be long before a seaside resort and probably Blackpool uh, is nominated as a World Heritage Site. So thank you for listening. I'll hand you back to Emma. Thanks, Duncan. So what stage is Blackpool at in that process and when are we likely to find out if they are given that World Heritage status? Oh, well, it applied in uh, 2009 and its application was rejected by the UK government. So the government didn't even forward it to UNESCO. Uh, and since then, they're still talking about putting in another application. I just think they've had their fingers burnt uh, and they're a bit reluctant to. But I think their time has come. It won't be long, I think, before the government is prepared to accept that a seaside town can be a World Heritage Site. Brilliant. Thank you, Duncan. And we'll see you um, later on for the discussion as well. We're just going to take a short break now. So um, feel free to use this time to get up, stretch your legs, um, grab a drink, do whatever you need to do. Um, we'll be back in five minutes time. For those of you who are staying by your screens, we have some short videos to share with you, including a little glimpse into what life in Bournemouth was like back in 1939. So enjoy the break and we'll see you in five minutes. Picture is old game, but these pictures of old Bournemouth were taken only 70 years ago. How the pier approach looked then, and today, 70 years of remarkable growth, during which a little Hampshire village of 600 souls grew into a modern resort of 130,000 people. At the same time, the front was developed, but the natural beauties of the cliffs were left unspoiled. The wide sweep of the bay embraces a magic carpet of golden sand, another example of nature's generosity to this south coast retreat. An interesting fact about this part of the coast is that there are four instead of two daily tides. Consequently, the water recedes very little during the changes. And today we have the run, or if you prefer it, the walk, of a magnificent promenade along the entire length of the seaboard. But what of the town itself? Well, here's the square of 1865. And near the same spot today. 
As the natural beauty of the coastline is preserved, so are its natural amenities. The Bourne stream is fringed with parkland and public gardens that stretch into the very heart of Bournemouth. The early town planners left a handsome inheritance in these fine expanses of woodland. Indeed, that impression of openness and breadth of view is perhaps the most outstanding characteristic of this typically English resort. Of man-made attractions, probably most of us have heard over the air the famous municipal orchestra. Welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed that short break and the chance to see what Bournemouth looked like almost 80 years ago. So we've seen how the way our seaside spaces look have changed, but how about the way we use those spaces? Our next speaker, Dr Sam Goodman, will be talking about our contemporary uses for seaside spaces and what the future might hold. Hi Sam, over to you. Hi everyone. Thank you, Amanda. Yes, my name's Sam Goodman and uh, I thought I'd start just by introducing my research interests. I am generally interested in health, humanities and place, which means I research stories of how people, place and illness or health intersect, either in history, uh, literature or wider media cultures or through institutions such as museums. So what I'm going to be talking about um, this evening um, is essentially framed around two ideas. Firstly, that of health geographies and healthy spaces which um, addresses how there are beliefs in some places as especially or naturally therapeutic, but also the kinds of spaces in which healing happens, such as clinical settings. And secondly, the contemporary use of coastal space in this vein, 
with a particular focus on Bournemouth as the coast I know best. I'm going to start, much like some of our uh, other presenters this evening, with a quick fire quiz, however. So I have three questions, no poll, just three questions. And you're going to have to forgive me for this first one because I never studied Latin at school, so bear with me with the pronunciation. Question one, please put your answers in the chat. What does the Bournemouth town motto, pulcritudo et salubritas, mean? So what does the Bournemouth town motto, pulcritudo et salubritas, mean? Can't see any answers in the chat yet, but I'm expecting some hasty Googling from people wherever they are. Ah, here we go. Health and beauty, happiness and health, something and celebrate. Beautiful and healthy. Quite a few coming in for beauty and health, healthy air, health and well-being. Yes, I think fairly consistent response from people here. So excellent, your Latin much better than mine. Indeed, it is beauty and health. So question two, um, again, answers in the chat. Why did Captain Lewis Tregonwell found the town of Bournemouth in 1820? So why did Captain Lewis Tregonwell found the town of Bournemouth in 1820? And I will say that actually this one is an ever so slight trick question. There are two answers I'll accept. Getting a few good ones coming in, health benefits for his wife, paddle steamers, something about the healthy air. Ah, he was here to see off the smugglers. Water cure, the land was cheap. Nice pragmatism there, Richard, yeah, good point. Um, Essentially, the, um, <laughs> the official story, the story the town likes to tell, is, as Anya was alluding to earlier, Bournemouth began as a spa town with the involvement of Captain Tregonwell's wife, who was quite insistent on how much she loved the area and asked him to purchase the land. However, um, whilst he was ostensibly on the south coast to see off those smugglers, there are persistent rumours he was actually one of them and allowed his butler to uh, oversee the operation whilst he was otherwise engaged. And finally, question three. Um, the current council building in Bournemouth was once what? So the current council building in Bournemouth was once what? General idea is good if you can be more specific. Oh, hospital, hotel, yeah. Oh, straight in out of the gate. Jill Norman, Hotel Mont D. Excellent. It was indeed a hotel. It was the Mont Doré Hotel and Spa, no less, where guests were reputedly given waters from the Auvergne region of France. So thank you all for your uh, input into the chat there. The point of that little quick quiz was just as to illustrate and reinforce, as you heard earlier from Anya, um, how Bournemouth's history and the history of the seaside town more generally is deeply entwined with its reputation, not just as a holiday resort, but for its benefits for health, and latterly, more recently, um, for its benefits to well-being. And this theme continues to define its cultural significance today. We've heard too from other presenters um, how heritage is key to coastal sites, and this is also true in relation to health. The kind of health histories that I touched on in those questions um, still make themselves felt today, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, which I'll be talking about um, very shortly, but also more generally and culturally in how we think about coastal spaces and their benefits to physical and mental health. So on that, there's a second piece of audience participation for you all. I'd like you to just take a few seconds to input into the chat as many words as you can think of related to the health benefits that you perceive in relation to seaside spaces. So any kind of health benefit you perceive in relation to the coast, please pop it into the chat.
Yeah, here we go. Clean air, one at nature and very grounding. That's a good one. Sunshine, sea swimming, fresh air, iodine rich. Also a very good one. Calming views. Relaxation, fun, rest. Great to be at one with thoughts. Yes, definitely. Massive mental health benefits. Wonderful. You can see you're all very well versed. Bournemouth Tourist Board has clearly done its job. So yes, I mean, as I had expected, um, many of you have put in ideas that are all the kind of traditional associations with Bournemouth, which have been very much reinforced or have again come back to the fore of public discourse in the pandemic. And what I have uh, talked about in my research and also in my teaching is how health and pleasure at the seaside have always gone hand in hand. And were often affected in a mixture of clinical and geographical sites. As you heard from Anya earlier, encapsulated with places such as Invalid's Walk. So the sea air would have doubtless felt as refreshing to those who had traveled from industrial cities, um, something town planners encouraged by further planting the pine trees, of course, with pine oil and resin as a natural decongestion, um, as it does to us today. And with the reference to the solarium earlier, which was fantastic, because I was going to talk about this and now I can you know, point to the specific site. Whilst we now view the benefits of sunshine in terms of our exposure to vitamin D, and I imagine in the recent hot weather, we've all had that conversation about how good it feels to have some sun on our faces again. In the early 20th century, light therapy or heliotherapy for natural light and phototherapy for artificial light was a popular medical practice supported by those specific buildings, such as the solarium that Anya mentioned. As Fiona Smith argues, though, medical geographies are not just about the intersection of place and healing, but also about how changing understandings of place, disease or health interrelate, often as a result of new knowledge or new diseases and conditions. And this is very much where we can speak to the pandemic. So hopefully um, you'll be able to see some slides very shortly. Um, in the first pandemic summer, the middle of 2020, um, Bournemouth suddenly became the center of a British media storm for 48 hours or so. And it's an example of what is known as over tourism. And again, I will reference Anya here because she has written about this in her published work in The Conversation. Um, and this um, perceived boom in staycations and changed habits, something that um, actually was a, a kind of acceleration of something that had already been happening, um, resulted in this media storm. And it also led to what we might call a paradox of healthy spaces. The cultural premium of healthy spaces such as coastal spaces results in too many people um, accessing them or trying to seek them out, which in turn invalidates its benefits and healthy qualities. And Bournemouth in 2020 was marked by overcrowding, as you can see here, litter and antisocial behavior, as you'll hopefully be able to see in some of the other images. Um, tensions with residents, which always exist. I, I love the mention of uh, grockles in the chat earlier, a word I know well. Um, but also um, strain on emergency services as well, which in the context of um, stay at home, save the NHS, was again particularly contentious. And you can see the photo of the Durdle Door air rescue, an extraordinary image from the time. Um, however, as modern as all these concerns were, there is also a link here when we talk about the paradox of healthy spaces, back to the historical concerns of Victorian social anxieties too. There has always existed a perception of coastal spaces as sites on the edge, so away from the traditional moral centres of domestic British life, but also away, therefore, from traditional moral values. So the holiday to the seaside was a holiday from the norm as well as it was from work. And once you are out of your normal area, the norms of behaviour don't apply. And some of these, again, very much returned to that discourse um, in that pandem pandemic summer. Bournemouth too is, um, pandemic aside, still a site of excessive, um, potentially unhealthy behaviours with its popular and growing nighttime economy, a way in, in which it has certainly tried to rebrand and rejuvenate itself in the past 20 years as a sort of club capital of the South. 
Beyond the pandemic, though, we can look to at regeneration of coastal spaces in other forms, as well as their reinterpretation through a health lens. And the slide that you should hopefully be able to see now um, of the WAVE project is a charitable organization that uses the artificial reef as a springboard for an initiative that provides mental health support through surfing and physical activity, and shows how the health benefits of coastal space extend beyond those purely clinical settings that I mentioned earlier. I have generally focused in my talk tonight on um, Bournemouth as the coast I know best, but we also shouldn't homogenize, of course. Other coasts offer different kinds of health benefits and different experiences. And a book that I, I use regularly in my teaching and one that I absolutely adore is Jean Spracklin's fantastic memoir, Strands, A Year of Discoveries on the Beach, in which she reminds us of the benefits of repetition and the import of time as well as space and place as she walks on Ainsdale Sands in the northwest coast of Britain. And this repeated action of walking, like surfing in some ways, like returning um, year after year to the coast for a holiday, is an occupation over time that provides both physical and mental benefit to the individual and to communities. It speaks to ideas of change and to coasts as sites of return and renewal, with parallels between the tides, the seasons, and the individuals that access them. They are all similar, but never quite the same. And they are this rich accumulation of time and change in the landscape. And I'll start to draw towards a close there just so we can get to discussion. And I'm sure in that discussion, we can think about what the future of coastal spaces and well-being um, and the well-being industry may look like. Will we see more active physical initiatives like the WAVE project supported by clinical knowledge or those that emphasize the mental benefits of mindfulness, stillness and respite from our busy lives that are perhaps more self-directed? One thing that is very much on my mind at the moment is how city status might affect the seaside town. This has just happened in South End, of course, and has been a perennial topic in Bournemouth for several years with mixed feelings amongst local residents. Whatever happens, I imagine preserving that motto, health and beauty, um, will be just as important as it ever has been. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sam. I didn't even know Bournemouth had a motto, um, let alone what it meant. So I've learned something new tonight and I've lived in Bournemouth for uh, half my life. So that was really interesting. Thank you. Um, let's welcome back all of our speakers now. Anya, Tim, Duncan and Sam is staying with us for our discussion. We've had some brilliant questions coming in throughout the evening. So I'm going to take it from the top with the most popular question, uh, which is from Caroline. Are British seasides similar to seasides globally? And Tim, you've, you've addressed this in the chat, but do you want to expand on the point you made there about some of the similarities with other resorts around the world? Yeah, so we think of the seaside as a kind of uniquely English invention. Uh, but of course, there's similar resorts uh, in what I've described as the low countries, so the Netherlands, Belgium, north of France. Um, San Sebastian is an interesting one. John Walton, the seaside historian, has done some research on that, and there are similarities there in terms of the offer. Even Coney Island, uh, we can see some parallels there. Of course, all these places are what we call cold water destinations, and the clue is in the name there if you dip your toe into the sea. Um, the Mediterranean resorts are warm water or second generation resorts. They're quite different, and they're, they're a lot younger as well. And uh, as I said in my presentation, age matters when it comes to you know, buildings and structures. And we've had a few questions around the kind of post-COVID landscape of seasides. Um, Rosemary has talked about her experiences in her northern coastal town where tenants are being evicted to make way for holiday lets. Um, we've had another question asking about whether this uh, trend for staycations will continue post-COVID or as travel restrictions loosen, people are going to go back to those um, holidays abroad. So um, does anybody want to come in on that? point. Anya, you wrote about this for the conversation, didn't you? So um, have you got any thoughts to share? Um, I think Rosemary's question is, is quite an interesting one because there's a couple of key trends going on here. Obviously, there's a, a worldwide growth of Airbnb and unlike many tourism and hospitality sectors during the pandemic that were obviously negatively impacted, Airbnb um, has actually grown in 2021 um, above 
2019 levels. So that, that's a, a global trend. Um, and obviously, a lot of landlords, going back to Rosemary's question, um, is it, are going to take advantage of, you know, getting a thousand pounds a week for a holiday let rather than a thousand pounds a month in long term rent. Yeah. And I think there's also a, a growing body of evidence that says in terms of international tourism, we're not going to see that return to pre-pandemic levels until 2024 at the very earliest in terms of our international travel. So I think domestic tourism is certainly looking like being a trend for the next few years. And of course, self-catering accommodation where maybe families who haven't been able to get together over the last couple of years can go as an extended family staying and self uh, catering accommodation away from the crowds um i think yeah it, it is a growing trend also taking dogs on holiday you know during the, the pandemic more and more people got pets and so they're going to want to take their their new pets on holiday with them and of course they can do that in rented accommodation at the coast does anybody else want to come in on that point do you think staycations are here to stay I suspect so. I, I think, of course, the um, the pandemic has been overtaken in the news cycle by the conflict in Eastern Europe. And, uh, you know, I mean, either way, this makes the potentially overseas travel more expensive and, and, you know, perceived to be more risky. So we live in uncertain times. And I expect for the foreseeable, we'll see, you know, the staycation boom uh, remain. Um, to my mind, it's key that resorts offer, you know, a healthy mix of outdoor um, possibilities and activities because we know there's very little chance of contracting COVID outdoors or in well-ventilated indoor spaces. And, uh, you know, we a large amount, you know, proportion of the population will still obviously have COVID in their back of their minds and perhaps be risk adverse. And also and the points we made about climate change as well and that kind of guilt associated with the flying and going mm. overseas, which might also contribute to more people choosing to stay local. Sorry, Sammy, you're going to come in there. No, not at all. Sorry. Um, I was just going to add to what Tim was saying and, and sort of pick up on that uncertainty and how, again, to think about sort of mental health benefits of, of coastal escapes, even just a short term escape from um, the pressures of daily life. Um, would be beneficial for, for many individuals. So being able to do that on a British seaside resort rather than commit with the uncertainty to a longer stay overseas um, is going to doubtless be attractive to, to many. And thinking of those health benefits, we've had a question from Helen around city beaches and whether there's been any research around how important the presence of the sea is, um, both in terms, I suppose, of those health benefits, but also how we enjoy those seaside spaces. So um, do you think that's an essential component or do you think those kind of virtual, even Tim, you were talking about, or city beaches can replicate that experience on a more local level for people? Yes. Um, I mean, nearly all city beaches are located by major rivers. Um, but of course, you can't swim in in the river um, unless you're very foolhardy. Uh, and it's not advised. So um, that's the one big difference. Of course, that will make, that's what makes them interesting, I think, because it's the absence of the sea that adds to the curiosity. But they tend to simulate um, the, the sea uh, through water atomizers, uh, temporary swimming pools so there's lots of water around uh, but it's that I think it's that artificial surreal nature of being by the seaside that isn't a seaside that's quite attractive when it comes to these places yeah I would add to that and just say that um, you know there is research out there into um, artificial environments of various kinds and their perceived benefits on health and they are effective to a point, I think, you know, it's about the suspension of disbelief to, to use a narrative term. If if you can sit there in a deck chair and perhaps your feet are touching sand and you can hear the kind of soundscape of the, the water bubbling away in the background, um, whilst it might not be crashing waves, it still adds to that perception that you are in a natural environment and say, you know, not on uh, sort of Bristol dockside or, or something. Um, if you can sort of manage to, to create that illusion, then again, for that temporary short term, period, perhaps it will work and have those benefits. 
Great. And I'm going to come to you now, Duncan, because there's a question around heritage um, oh. from Rachel, who said that even though buildings like Spanish City have been re restored, um, they've actually been kind of uh, changed their use to have restaurants or champagne, champagne bar rather than kind of restoring its original use. So where do you think the balancing act is in terms of preserving those buildings and making sure that they're kind of fit for modern purpose, but also retaining some of the, the charm um, that makes them so special and unique to begin with? between preservation where you sort of basically keep things as they are or conservation where you try to find a new use and manage that and um a lot of these buildings they're, they're never going to be able to recapture their previous use but the structure you know is still iconic and capable of being restored and, and repurposed for completely new contemporary uses uh, you know and add a champagne bar to something like spanish city and but you're potentially drawing in a new type of tourist whereas if you just try and restore what it what it was um, you're relying on the traditional product and the traditional type of tourist. So any, anything that's about kind of bringing new visitors in is going to involve finding new uses for a lot of these buildings. Uh, I mean, just look at what they've done on Bournemouth Pier, you know, with the um, the Rock Reef and the Adventure Centre and stuff like that. Um, it wasn't viable as a theatre and it couldn't carry on like that. And you could have probably, the town council could have bid for a lot of money to restore it as a theatre, but there wasn't the, the demand for it as a theatre. But then add a adventure kind of rock reef adventure playground and as it were and you've got a completely new product that's going to potentially attract new tourists uh so um seaside resorts i mean tim was making this point they they have to move forward don't they um they can't just kind of recapture what they were it's a case of kind of repurposing reconfiguring what they were for modern uses and modern tourists Great, thank you. And looking back to that development of the seaside resort, uh, Bethan has asked, how much did the British Empire and colonialism shape the seaside resort development economically and culturally? So Sam, I think this probably touches upon your areas of expertise, if you want to um, answer this question first. Definitely. I mean, um, it enormously, um, in m lots of ways, suddenly sort of rushed to mind. I mean, one thing that I have been um, sort of, you know, promising myself one day I'll write about is the, the retiree. Um, so this is something that appears in a lot of novels. I've noticed this in many sort of popular novels. Agatha Christie is a great example of this. You get the old Indian uh, army retired colonel or something that moves to Eastbourne or Bournemouth or, or so on. And there are these little communities that crop up that almost mimic um, those individuals' colonial service architecturally through sort of bungalows and, um, and villas and so on, um, but then also bring bring sort of some sense of that colonial society and its stuffiness and its prejudices back to the heart of of Britain so it kind of connects the colonial and the the domestic um sort of very wholeheartedly there other than that I mean in terms of my research interests looking at British identity over the last 70 to, to 80 years in that period of declining empire the thing that has rushed in to reinforce the British sense of selfhood in the absence of empire is nostalgia, history, and heritage. And a lot of that is from that period of, of the colonial heyday, the Victorian empire, the height of British power around the globe. And there's a very willing audience to, to engage with that in, in modern times. And it expresses itself across culture, not just um, sort of TV and film and theatre and, and media products, but also experience-based um, to attractions such as beaches and um, industrial sites and other sort of heritage locations that Duncan pointed out as well. We're almost out of time now, so I'm going to be cheeky and I'm going to ask a question to all of you, a quick fire question. And I'll be really interested to see um, what our audience think as well. So please do pop your answers in the chat as well. But um, to each of you, what is your favourite British seaside resort and why? So, Anya, I'll come to you first. I have to go with my hometown of Southport, basically because a lot of what Tim has talked about and uh, some of the topics that Sam has talked about and some of the topics that Duncan has talked about, I've seen over the last almost 50 years. So it's been interesting to watch the development or redevelopment of Southport. Okay, Duncan, you next. Um, it's got to be Blackpool because Blackpool's just outrageous. Uh, and it's extraordinary and uh, it's I mean, it's completely different from the place where I grew up. Um, but every time I go there, there's just there's something, as Tim would say, magical about it. There is just nowhere else in the world like Blackpool. 
Tim, I think I can guess what your answer is going to be, but um, I'll come to oh, you next. Wow, I might surprise you, actually. I was actually going to say Weymouth, would you believe? Because it features large in my formative years. And also, I'm a bit of a train buff, and there used to be a train that ran through the town uh, along the quayside there, which I thought was quite quite a novelty. So uh, so I'm going to go for Weymouth. They're real nice as well. Uh, Are you contractually obliged to say that, Tim? <laughs> Um, and Sam, finally, what's what's your favourite place to visit and why? Well, I, I'm going to have to come out to bat for Bournemouth, um, just uh, not just because I work there and uh, you know grew up there, but it's a place that is is so sort of entwined when I think back to my memories of the beach and, and my childhood and so on. We we had a beach hut at Southbourne, the more well-to-do end of the beach, of course, away from the tourists at the at the pier. We were local, we're not brothels, um, and I have memories of you know being in the sea for for forever till I was sort of wrinkly and prune-like and my mum sort of calling us in um, to come and sort of you know eat whatever she's put together and have a hot cup of tea so for me when I think of that coastline it's it's all of those kind of memories so yeah that's that's still there and still stays. Brilliant thank you all for your contributions this evening and for sharing your insights it's been really fascinating to hear from all of you and um, thank you to our audience this evening as well for engaging with us throughout the evening for sharing, sharing such brilliant questions and some of their comments and memories in the chat as well I've, I've really enjoyed tonight's event and I hope you have too um, so we've run out of time I'm afraid so I'm going to wrap up now um, but we'll be sending you an email following the event with um, some of the details of the resources that our um, speakers have mentioned in their presentations. So keep an eye out for that. And there'll also be a feedback survey as well. So if you've enjoyed tonight's event, please do let us know. And if there's anything we can do to make it better, um, please do share your feedback as it just ensures, us, um, ensures we can make sure these events are the best they can be. If you have enjoyed tonight's event, there's plenty more to come. So our next online public lecture will be on Tuesday, the 26th of April, around the secret life of Pool Harbour. So if you click on the green button that's on the bottom of your screen now or visit the Bournemouth University website, you can find out more about this and upcoming events as well. We're going to close this event now, but the chat will remain open. So um, please do continue to share any final thoughts or comments in the chat. Um, and you'll also be able to come back and watch the recording of the event um, by following the same link you used to join. Uh, thanks again to all our speakers and to all of our audience members for joining us this evening. I really hope you've enjoyed tonight's event and hopefully see you soon. Thank you and good night.